Ben's collars and stuff. He's a great research resource for that. So that's set in place. Now what we're gonna do is turn the motor around and lay it back over. So we're gonna put the Kickstarter assembly all back together. Honda made it really simple. If there's an alignment with some parts, they're gonna put, can you see this little dot right here? That little dot? Mm -hmm. Okay, and you see that one right there? That means that these two things, when they go together, have to be aligned. So now this is on that spline, and that's aligned with that one right there. Next thing, take the spring, and the spring cap, and put on there. This is our tensioner spring, and we're gonna lock that down into there. Then there's this. This is the split spacer. Bring the whole assembly up here, lock it in, twist it over, push that down. And now that's locked into place. So I'm going to use a little bit of Loctite on these to hold this plate in. And I use red Loctite. A lot of people out there are going to be like, oh, you should be using blue Loctite. But I just use a little dab. And the reason why I do is just to make sure these things don't back out and I don't have to get all crazy with tightening them up. In there. Just a little tension on them. That's good. Drop on the Kickstarter gear and the spacer. Well, let's go ahead and put this in. This looks like another gill product. On this side, let's go ahead and put the counterbalancer into it. I'll tell you a funny story. When I first started working on these, I had a guy bring me his Honda and uh, he was trying to take the motor apart and he got to the point where he had pulled the retainer plate off and he's trying to get the, the counterbalancer out, right? And of course, he's been underneath it prying with a screwdriver and everything. And he's like, ah, oh, this thing won't come out. Turn it like this and it pops right out. <laughs> so he had done a uh, hundred dollars or so damage to the cases that I needed to repair. Okay, so once again, put the plate on. I wanna make sure this is tight and it is. These cases are, these cases are really in good condition. I'm sharing this here. That in, get these tightened down, just like that. Okay, now we need to get this so that it is in time with the crank. So once again, we've got a dot here that aligns with the counterbalancer, and a dot here, which will align with a dot or a scribe mark in the aftermarket cranks. You can see this little scribe mark right there. That's gonna be located with a spline. And then down here, you can see the little dot. So I'm gonna take this. And if you, if you get an old crank that doesn't have a dot or a scribe mark, because some of the original aftermarket cranks didn't do that, this dot or scribe mark is going to be perfectly in line with the pin when the crank is at top dead center. So you may have to make your own dot or scribe mark. Now we're gonna put this on right like that and then line those up. And now we're dot to dot and we're dot to scribe. All right, so Michael, you had this problem, which a ton of people do and I see it come up on the Facebook pages, a bunch. See all the teething on the back side of the clutch? That is because, and they used to have a memo inside of these that said that if you used the thick style gear, you had to grind a bevel onto it so that it wouldn't come up and catch that. If you're using the thinner gear, it doesn't do it. But I would have thought by now with all the problems that had happened, Henson would have put a like a little bit more bevel in there. The 
the Wiseco baskets um, are clearanced for it. Matter of fact, I think all the baskets except for Henson has clearance for it. But what happens is because it's a little bit thicker, it comes up and it rubs on that. So after you put one in, guys will end up draining the oil and it looks like a rave party inside the motor because it's just filled with with, with glitter. It looks like, uh, <laughs> like um, um, anises is what it looks like. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead, and you can do this a couple of different ways, okay? You can uh, put it on a lathe and then use a grinder and spin it. You can spin it by hand. You could put it on a precision grinder. The biggest thing is, is you just need to knock this down all the way around so that it doesn't come in contact here. And I think probably what I'm gonna do is we're just gonna use the hand grinder and we'll knock this down because most people are gonna have that at home. So I'll show you how that works. I prefer this type of a wheel when I'm doing this kind of work. But basically what you're gonna do is just What you want to end up with is something like that. You just need to break that edge away so that it doesn't dig into the back of a brand new gasket or basket <laughs> with a gasket. <laughs> now Dave made that look really easy, but you don't have to do it that quick. You can take your time. Yeah, you can take your time on the thing. Um, and like I said, normally what I would do is I have an end of a crank stub. They get bolted on it and go into the lathe and I'll spin it on the lathe and then cut it. But if all you have is this, you can very easily do it with this. See the profile of it and just get the thing knocked down a little bit so that it doesn't dig into the back of a Henson basket. If you're using any of the other baskets, you won't have that problem. Put that on and then we get this lined up. Make sure you've got it. The, the shoulder bolt goes through there. And what is the that, the shift detent? Yes. Yeah, this is our shift detent for the 250R. And then I'm going to put this over here. Just make sure that washer stays underneath there. I know my hands are in the way. Let me get this started. Just like that. this is still loose and you haven't got it underneath the bind and there it is just like that so there's this little recessed area right in here so I'm just taking this um, five millimeter T handle come underneath this get in there and push it up out of the way then align this with the pin and you'll know get it down there you'll know if it's not aligned correctly and then just let that rest against it. We're gonna come in here like this. Tighten that up. And then I will grab the torque wrench to tighten this up. Snap on, baby. Ooh. Yeah, I know, right? Probably overpaid for this thing. My snap on man, I, I nicknamed him Satan because he gets you on the truck and then the next thing you know, you're indebted for the rest of your life. we go. What'd you torque that to, Dave? Uh, that's, uh, you want to go between 12 and 15, or in neutral, and then first. And now we're in first. Okay. So the transmission rolls smoothly. Let's go ahead and put this whole, uh, the shifting mechanism in here, and I'll show you how I put that together. The biggest, pe or the biggest problem is, is in getting these things in and out without the whole ratcheting assembly coming apart. Let's, let's just go ahead and take this back apart. So if everything falls out, it goes in like this. Drop in the spring, drop in this pin right here, and then put the pawl in with the rounded in towards that. Squeeze it from underneath, bring this over, then pinch it from the top and place it in there. Put the top hat on it. A little bit of red. 
on these and go ahead and I know right now there's somebody pounding on the keyboard. Never use red Loctite on something you want to take apart. Yeah, well, as soon as you have a bolt come loose and go through your motor, and I've seen it a lot, don't you don't have to go putting a half a gallon on them. Just enough to keep them from coming loose again until you want them to come loose. We're going to put it in the shift shaft and make sure that the washer is on it. We get a lot of motors in here that are missing that. Place it down inside there, lock it over the pin, and we're good to go. So now we're going to install the clutch basket. And don't worry about this if you have a clutch that has this. I've seen this happen a lot over the years. I've never seen any downstream effects from it other than just all the aluminum that it puts in the oil. If you've got an older, an 85, what you're gonna find is that you've got this collar with a separate washer. You're gonna have a bearing, a little spacer, and a bearing. 86 and after though is going to look like this. Either way, it's pretty much gonna go on the same way. You would drop on the washer, you would put in the inner sleeve and then put bearing spacer bearing but on 86 and after you just drop on this sleeve and then put these two bearings on now you're saying 86 and after so i'm assuming you're talking about the trike motors would have that yeah the trike the motors have it too yeah just the just the um just the uh original trike motors the 85 motors had the had that um whole component system this was just a lot simpler it's a much cleaner way to do it and we'll take this and when you put it down, if it doesn't feel like it wants to go all the way down, just give it a little bit of turn because it's got to align with these teeth and the teeth back here. So like if you saw when I put it on and it doesn't want to align completely, just give it a little bit of turn and it'll lock down. This washer, it goes in here. It doesn't matter, it can go either direction. Then the inner hub. There you go. So we've got this inner washer, we've got the locking washer, and the lock nut. And anybody that's been familiar with me for over the years knows I never put these back in, but since Michael's got one, it's gonna go back in. But I am still going to put some Loctite on this because I have had this fail in the past and these come loose and then the whole assembly starts shifting, but I have never had Loctite fail. So this is where I will put a little bit more on this. And then we'll tighten this down. So I'm gonna use this. I know you can get these tools. I just cut this one on my plasma cutter, but it's gonna locate like this. And that'll lock the two baskets together. Just, that's enough with the Loctite and with the uh, retainer. You won't have a problem. Now we'll go ahead and bend the tabs on the retainer over and then install the clutch. Put a little bit of red Loctite on this. Make sure that the wave washer says out. Put it in here. And what are we torquing it to, Michael? 29 to 36 foot pounds. All right. Now with this, we can just let this come all the way around here. Lock up against that. And there we go. I'm gonna bring this down. Next thing, we're gonna go ahead and put in the clutch arm. Run that around. Take this. And this is actually an 87 pin. You can tell because of this little groove here. But that's fine as long as we get all the spacing. And we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and reuse this we may be back in here in a second to get it to do some modifications to it but we're going to get it locked in i can feel it pushing on me so i know that's right and then we do have the 88 top hat piece with the bearing and spacer and we get all that in there like that and then drop this like this and now we are going to put on one of these girls. 
This is probably one of my favorite new products out. This is the tin plate recluse clutch. And I know anybody that looks into them is going to say they're expensive, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's worth it. We have put these in some of the drag bikes and the motocross bikes, and they hold more power with less spring, so you get a much easier pull. Uh, the, all, the other thing too is because this is a 10 plate clutch system, you get a much smoother engagement. There's no time where you're starting to let out the clutch and then the, the clutch seems to grab. These things are so smooth and so linear. The other thing too that I really like about what they did is these little stainless steel inserts and you get them every time you get a clutch pack and potentially you're just not gonna wear your clutch basket out like you do with a standard clutch system because these get replaced every time. So really like this setup a lot. So that'll prevent getting any grooves in the fingers. Yes, right? yeah, that get pounded into it over time. And it is, it's a bit fiddly to put together, but it's not, it's not impossible. So we're gonna fit these down inside of here. And like I said, I, I really like them. We did a bunch of testing on them while they were still in the development phase. And uh, I really do like them a lot. I think it was a great, uh, a great piece to bring over to the 250R. By the way, 250R clutches and 350X clutches use the same plates, so I think Recluse needs to make a kit like this for the 350Xs. But that would be great. Now. Because we are going to fire this up right away, we're going to go ahead and coat these in oil, all sides, before we install them. So I'm going to get them in a bag and give them a little bit of oil and then we'll go ahead and drop them in place. So we're actually using Recluse Oil. Yeah, we're going to reuse their recommended oil. And we might go ahead and let these just soak for a while. All right, guys, we're back. We're gonna put the clutch pack together. It's day two right now. Clutch plates have been soaking overnight. And now I'm gonna show you, cause this can be a little bit fiddly, but it's not a big, it's not a big process, especially if you've got it on a stand. So here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to insert the tops in like this. And you just have to be careful with it like I said, it's easier when it's on a stand. Now I can feel that it's fighting me a little bit, but I'm not gonna try and fight it. I'm just gonna be real ginger with it. And then I get it pushed in there. I'm gonna leave it about that far because I'm gonna build the stack as I go in. So fiber and then steel, fiber. Now, now Dave, when you put these steels in, do you put the, the leading edge uh, rounded or sharp? Either way. Do you, do you keep them consistent or no? I've never seen, and, and that's another one of those things where builders go back and forth about it, but I've never seen that there's been any sort of difference on wear or Hirsch power. Um, so I'm gonna put it in. I think as I'm peeling off the pack this time, it's sharp edge out, but it wouldn't matter to me. And I know, like I said, I know a lot of people are gonna be like, oh man, you gotta do it one way or another, but I've built thousands of motors over 36 years and if I don't see a problem, I'm not going to go make a problem where there is no problem. Right. And like I said, people have complained about, about the difficulty to install these, but I'm gonna tell you right now that the benefits way outweigh any sort of difficulties getting them installed. Right, and realistically, how much time are you spending putting your clutch in and then actually using it? Well, exactly. Let's just follow this through in real time. I kind of want, people to see 
Now I definitely want people to see how this is done so that if they run into a problem that, you know, they can reference this video and see how it was that we got around the problem. Definitely one of those procedures you don't want to rush or force. No, not at all. Always, I'm putting the top in first. Just kind of fitting it up in there. And you'll notice as you get more and more of the plates in, that it gets easier to get them seated. Just like that. Right about now, everybody that's watching this is like, man, I wish he'd go like twice the speed on the thing. <laughs> We can do that in the yeah. yeah, overdrive it. <laughs> well, I think uh, the majority of the audience that's going to watch this is going to be pretty interested because they're probably going to be doing this themselves. Yeah. Well, and like I said, it's, it's one of those things where um, people say to engine builders all the time, well, you make that look so easy. Well, that's you work with this stuff enough and you figure out all the nuances of what it is to take, you know, what it takes to get it from start to completion. Right. And like I said, once you get a few of them in, then the rest of them go in. I wonder what these fibers are made of. I don't know if you see like... <clears throat> They've got, I'm not exactly sure. This is nothing new for them. It's actually ported over uh, from what I understand from uh, other applications. It looks like they've, and I'm just making a guess here, but it looks like these plates have probably been laser cut because they're quite a bit thinner, but that actually making these on steel accomplishes a couple of things. Number one, these steel plates don't expand like an aluminum plate does when it gets hot. So we don't seem to see the clutch drift if you're using the clutch a lot, you know those people, people are riding along and you're using your clutch a lot and then you find that the clutch is starting to get soft and so you'll reach up and you'll adjust it and then you'll take the bike back, let it set, it'll get cool and now your clutch is really tight. Well, that's because the plates are expanding and then recontracting. But by putting these on steels, you don't get that expansion and contraction rate so your clutch remains pretty much an adjustment all the time. That's what we found anyways with, with all the testing on it. So like I said, I'm, I'm thoroughly impressed with what they have going on here. All right, so the clutch pack is in. Now the next thing that we're gonna do is critical with setting up a clutch, and that is determining if the throw, the spacing on this is correct so that we have the correct amount of alignment on the arm. And this is how I go about checking that and you can see it was hanging up right on the edge of this right here so this lip was catching on that so I just had to put it in there and get it underneath of it so now everything's all underneath and we're we're clicked in so I'm gonna take and put in two springs do not over tighten these things bring them down that's it the spring tension itself will keep these from backing back out. There's no reason to go gorilla tight on these. Like people send me these clutch inner hubs all the time that they've broken them off from just getting crazy on the thing. Okay, now look at this. You see how much movement there is here? Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, now look it up here and look at how much movement there is on the top of that. And if we can look down, if you can get a shot straight down on it, I'm gonna put some, some pressure on it. Can you see how that's not paralleling with this line right here? Yes. Okay, all right. We already have too much extension on this, which means that the way that the pack is set up, this plate is actually stuck out a little bit farther than what it would have been when it was adjusted from the factory. Because this here should be, you should have a little bit of play in this. You wanna be able to feel a little bit of play but just a little bit of play. And this should be when it's under, when it's actually right up against it, when we're touching it, we should be about parallel, right about here. 
So what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna either need to add a spacer to this thing, put in a thicker spacer, or rework the rod so it's a little bit longer. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and pull this back off now. <coughs> And what happens is if you get it over accentuated here, then you're, you're past the, um, you've got the flat spot in there that's pushing on the rod, okay? And it only has so much articulation that it can do. So if we're already at an angle on it, then we have very little motion that we can push on the rod. So what happens is you pull on your clutch You've got to, first off, you've got to take a bunch of slack out of it and then you pull on the clutch and it doesn't feel like there's much to be pulled there, okay? And people will end up burning up their clutches prematurely because when they're pulling in their clutch, they're actually not pushing the basket or the, the pressure plate out away from the clutches in the basket. Makes sense. Yeah. Now the opposite direction of that is not having enough play. So if we come over here and we start to move this and there's zero play, then we don't have enough and what's gonna happen is the clutch is going to be dragging. So we're gonna be dragging the clutch. You're not gonna be able to take enough out of the, out of the cable because we've, we don't have anything to give here. And so you're gonna burn the clutch up. You're gonna think that your brand new clutch is slipping because it's actually slipping because it's not making, it's not making full contact. All right, so that's something else that you wanna look for. And in that case, then we would have to go in and put in a thinner washer or maybe take the rod and take a little bit off the end. And when I say a little bit, I'm talking just a little bit because a, a little bit goes a long ways in this whole assembly. So we're gonna remove this. And uh, because you had the, the Neil Pritchard kit in here, you actually had two different washers, but I believe the OEM washer is gonna be the thicker of the two. Let me grab my calipers right, yeah. and we'll measure out and see what the actual difference is. So off camera, we did a little bit of work just to see what was gonna make this work. So here's the OEM washer that goes on this kit on the outside. And that is 40 thousandths of an inch thick. This is the washer that came with uh, Neil's kit, which is 34 thousandths of an inch thick. And if we put both of these, and I'm gonna put the stainless steel one up against there and then add this filler washer. Go ahead and place this back on here. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in the other three springs and make sure that we still have the same amount of play. So, like I said, if we were putting together an OEM motor with all OEM parts, most of this stuff is things that you don't need to check for. But because there's so many aftermarket parts, used parts, these are things that you need to check so that you're not at the dunes and you have these, these kind of alignment problems that you run into with stuff. Shout out to Andrew Jean. You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> okay, so we've still got our play on the end here and our alignment looks really good right here. So I'm liking that a lot. And the next thing we'll do is go ahead and put the water pump back into the water, uh, into the clutch side cover and then get that installed here. So we've got the uh, clutch cover here and the bearing and seal is still installed, installed. So I'm going to place this in there, get it seated. This is also an aftermarket clutch cover. So if you guys are wondering why there's there's not typically a removable clutch cover like that. Yeah. Yeah, this is a nice piece. Um, uh, Who built this for you? Nelson Precision. Nelson Precision, yeah, this is a nice, this is a nice piece for sure. Um, make sure that when you're putting this on, and this one is stuck down in there, but there is a little steel washer that goes in there. If you lose that when you go to put this down on here, you're not gonna get the correct compression on this, and it's gonna feel really tight because you're over compressing this spring. 
okay? So a lot of times this will get lost. People will put these things together and they're like, man, it's just really super hard for me to turn over my water pump. It's because we've lost the amount of clearance that that little, can you see that down in there? That little spring, okay. So we're gonna put this down on here. And that goes on like that. And obviously we wanna have some sort of a ceiling washer on the outside. And then we will put some some Loctite on this. I see these things come loose all the time and then people are weeping out of here. You take it apart and this thing's setting off to the side, you know, or it's, it's laying down in there. Um, so we are going to put a little bit of Loctite on that. And there's a, without some sort of a piece of tooling, it's really hard to hold on to these things, hold on to the shaft and the piece. And I've seen guys like they'll jam something into here to tighten them up, but I've also seen these get broke off really easy too. So we're gonna actually do where we clamp on both sides of this, um, or in three ways that's non-damaging so that we can get this thing tightened up. I'll show you how I'm gonna do that here in a second. Okay, now we're non-destructively holding that part. And we're just gonna put, and along with the tension that went on there, and the Loctite, we shouldn't have any problems with that. And now you should be able to turn it. If it's got, if you're trying to turn this and you can't turn it by hand, then you need to check and make sure that you've got the correct amount of spacing on the thing. So, you can see, using the three jaw, of like a half inch chuck doesn't leave any sort of marring. I, I've seen guys that'll grab them in here on this part with, uh, with a, like I said, a vice grips. Um, and sometimes it can leave a little bit of profiling in the thing. Um, that's really not gonna kill anything. I mean, yeah, it's not, the, it's not the ideal situation, but a lot of times when you're at the races or at the dunes, you have to do what you need to do to get the thing ready to go for a ride or get yourself back into a moto. Um, just try not to pinch down on this or pry between here and here because this, it can snap these off. I'm not saying that happens every time, but it is a possibility. Now here's where I'm going to use the stand again, because I'm gonna lay this over. Just like that. I'll put the gasket on it. Make sure that you get this lined up with the drive pin in there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to point this down at this hole right here, okay? So can you see that? That's pointed at that hole, basically. And then I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna turn this until I see that that is pointed at the hole also. See if you can get down in there and see, you can see the pin down yep, inside yep, there. I see. All right. That way this water pump drive and its corresponding pin are lined up with each other. So then we're gonna take this, drop it on here. And there it is. Now that's seated down against it. So Dave's just putting in all the bolts for the clutch cover. Now Dave, do you typically do these in a crisscross pattern? Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and forth uh, one of the most important things though that I see people do all the time, especially with gasket alignment, is they'll start putting a bolt in one at a time and then they'll get to a point where they can't get a bolt in. So I like to get all of my bolts in and down before, you know, and they're still loose, everything's still loose, but they're all in. And then I'm gonna go ahead and start tightening them up. And I'll just do, I'll just basically get them seated. And there's no real, there's no real pattern that I'm doing. I mean, I'm sure that somebody will have a pattern out there that they like. I just go back and forth until I get everything, all of them nice and tight. And then when I'm done, I am gonna go all the way around it in a counterclockwise or clockwise manner and just make sure that I didn't miss anything. So, so now we're gonna go ahead and put the water pump on. You're gonna have your two gaskets, your separator, Water pump housing, another nice product right here. I really do like this. Get our pins in place. 
gasket. We're using all Honda OEM gaskets. Yes. Apparently most of the aftermarkets are not not that reliable. Aftermarket gaskets for the most part don't fit where the crap. Sorry. <laughs> they don't fit very well. Um, I think a lot of that reason is is because when they were drawn up because they're they're punch pressed and it costs a lot of money to make those those types of pressing assemblies um, and they probably got it off a little bit now I, I have a CNC gasket cutter so when I was cutting the gaskets out for the center case and I use my gaskets but I still uh, uh, Honda gaskets are you can't go wrong with that um, the uh, but when I was making mine, I just kept adjusting the drawing until it got exactly what I needed it to be. A lot easier. We're gonna have two longer bolts and two shorter bolts. Always the longer bolts are gonna go through the areas that have the, the dowel or centering pins on them. And we'll go ahead and run this down. Now, if you are riding your bike or you see some water coming out of this hole right down here, one of two things has happened. That nut that's in the center has come loose or the back side of that seal has become damaged. And this little hole is so that the water will get out of the motor instead of getting into the assembly and going into the bottom end. But it's also, it's also your tattletale sign that that seal has gone bad because it would be hard to know if you didn't have something dripping out of here. We'll lay this girl back over swap it around and put the stator assembly on it. All right, Dave, now what are you doing here? Um, okay, so it, th you'll see these things all the time. People will pull them apart and uh, they're sweating um, on the inside and they start to rust the stator. So there's a couple of things that you can do. You can put in, you can put in a tap down here and I've seen this on some of the older bikes. Put in a tap down here and then put a put a rubber hose on it because we want to get it up so we don't want to go in water and end up in here but somewhere for it to leak out you see some water down here and you drop it down or you can take this and run it up into a tap between the air filter and the carburetor where there's vacuum and you basically keep a vacuum pulled on this all the time and I've been doing that for years because on the west coast uh, they sweat inside there all the time, especially in Oregon, not so much down in California, but in Oregon, they sweat all the time. So I just keep a vacuum pulled on this and then it's all good. Then we don't end up with that uh, as being a problem. So I'm installing it in yours because I noticed there was some rust in there. And so we'll just, we'll get ahead of that. So we're starting out with an OEM setup. We've actually got three different ignition systems that I want to try. And I would have done the dynoing on this, but I didn't get the ignition systems till a couple of days ago and we need to put this thing back together and we're kind of on a tight uh, schedule. So we're gonna go take this thing to the sand and make some runs, but we're starting out with uh, just a regular old OEM 86 ignition system that I've tested on the bench and made sure that it, it works good. And then we're just gonna try the other ignition systems and see how that works out for you. Don't have to get crazy tight with that either. Okay. We're good there. Now let's uh, move on to getting the cylinder, piston, head, and all that stuff on there. All right, so we got the upper end rod bearing in, and we're gonna go ahead and put the piston pin back into it. Now this already got the pin in this side because this top end came off of our bottom end here that we used for all the dyno work.